Hello and welcome. I want to thank you for viewing the final installment of the Meet the Professor series for this fall. We will be back next year with a brand new slate of faculty members. So don't forget to check back here and keep a lookout in your email inbox for all the series announcements and schedule. On this edition, we welcome Dr. Charlotte Lorenzen, Professor of Spanish in the Department of Modern Languages at Elizabethtown College. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Dr. Lorenzen. Thank you so much, it's my pleasure. Sure. Um, Dr. Lorenzen is a foreign language education and teacher preparation professional dedicated to lifelong learning. The unifying theme across her teaching, research, and service experience is her intense interest in bringing linguistic, linguistically and culturally diverse people together through a share, shared love of learning about others' ways of expressing of themselves and existing in our shared world to engage in positive and productive ways. Dr. Lorenzen's current project entitled Empowering Global Citizens Through the Scholarship of Engagement engages students of Spanish and Spanish education in meaningful service to the local community as they teach Spanish to local children. Everyone learns language and culture. The college students learn how to teach Spanish within the cultural context in which it is used. And Dr. Lorenzen conducts research on how to best prepare the college students to engage in curriculum design, unit, and lesson planning, material creation, lesson enactment, assessment of student learning, and critical reflection on the effectiveness of their teaching. Dr. Lorenzen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So my presentation today is called Empowering Global Citizens Through the Scholarship of Engagement. So what is a global citizen? A global citizen is a member of the wider community of humanity, the world, or a similar whole, which is wider than that of a nation state or other political community of which we are normally thought to be citizens. What is the scholarship of engagement? It requires the use of knowledge that results from one's role as a faculty member and applies an integrative approach to the traditional domains of research, teaching, and service. Scholarship of engagement activities are activities that break new ground or are innovative. They require a high level of disciplinary expertise. They can be replicated and elaborated. They produce results that can be documented. They produce results that can be peer reviewed by other researchers and they have significance or impact. In our children's Spanish program, which is in its 10th year, we have a service learning community based project in which college students learn to teach Spanish. These are normally Spanish ed majors, but sometimes Spanish majors or maybe education majors with a Spanish minor. The local children learn and use Spanish. Community partners teach us language and culture. Sometimes these are children enrolled in the program. Sometimes it's their parents. Sometimes it's people from the community who come in as guest speakers or we do field trips, but we try to engage students of all types in our program. So we have children learning Spanish as a foreign language, Children learning Spanish is a heritage language, meaning they hear it at home, but maybe they've never learned it in school. And then even children who are native speakers, who've grown up speaking the language, maybe learning it in school, and now they're in central Pennsylvania with no other way to learn and use their Spanish. So I engage with and contribute to the scholarship in my field. So everything we do is research-based, and I'm always going back to the existing literature, also trying to contribute it to it myself, based on what we have done in our program, which is based on what others have done, but we're trying to improve both our program and what others can do in the future. All of the participants become empowered to become global citizens. So even though we're in the middle of central Pennsylvania in a rural setting, uh, there's no reason why we can't interact with people all across the world. What is service learning? Service learning is a form of experiential education, meaning we don't just talk about it, we actually practice it. Learning occurs through a cycle of action and reflection as students work with others through a process of applying what they are learning to community problems and at the same time reflecting upon their experiences as they seek to achieve real objectives for the community and deeper understanding for themselves. So hopefully it's easy for you to imagine that an education major who's learning about classroom management, for example, or how to work with children with individualized education programs, how they can practice what they're learning in theory in the classroom with these children each week. 
classes are 50 minutes, so just under an hour. So we spend as much time planning and reflecting as we do teaching. But the time that we teach is valuable for the students and a lot of learning occurs in that 50 minute class for the students, but also for the Spanish education or Spanish or education majors at the college who are learning how to teach. Service learning should be mutually beneficial, meaning that all of the participants in the service learning experience can learn as much as they serve. So if it's just service, that's not quite service learning. If it's just learning, then it's missing a whole part, right? So service learning is normally written that way with the hyphen in the middle, um, showing that they're connected. So uh, my students engage in meaningful service, meaning that the people that they are serving have decided that it's meaningful. So there are types of service that people could do that would not be helpful because the community members did not want that. And we talk about that in my classes a lot about how the service needs to be something that is of real value to the community that you're serving. Also, the students need to have a learning component. So if they are only dropping in to share what they can do with the community, it's not enough. It needs to be using what they know in the community, but also bringing things back to their education, to our classroom, um, learning, for example, about uh, differentiated instruction. How do you work in a classroom with uh, a child who has autism and a child who's in the talented and gifted program? and a child who misses every other class, how do you work with those kids? So we do a lot of planning and we also pay a lot of attention to things like background knowledge, what do the kids already know, uh, motivation, what motivates the kids. So my students are practicing what they've learned in their education in Spanish classes, but they can't apply it without learning about their community partners and their needs. It's, they go hand in hand. So here's a quote that I really like. Um, explaining that no one is too small or too poor to have something to offer to their community. And I included this picture of these, these two. They're native Spanish speakers and they took our program for a while before they moved away. And we learned so much from both of them. Uh, they always were sharing how to, say, how to pronounce things or a different way to say something. And the, their mom would come in and help us with different things. Uh, she brought a bunch of her friends in once to sing the traditional song that you sing for birthdays in Mexico um, when it was her daughter's birthday. We brought it, she brought in uh, four or five of her friends and they all, you know, formed a big circle and sang to her daughter, which was really um, important for the daughter to have that cultural connection and also for the rest of us to have native speakers from that culture showing us what they do for birthdays. We do a lot of really fun activities. This is one where we have our scrapbooks and we made imaginary passports and we traveled to different countries. We pretended to. We did a lot of um, field trips to like the local grocery store. We had guest speakers come in and here's some pictures of the guest speakers. This is a student who had been to Ecuador, an E-Town college student, and she talked to us about weaving. So the students were able to learn a little bit about weaving. And if you can see the kids raising their hands, they really wanted to participate. Uh, the one raising her hand is my daughter, who is a kinesthetic learner. And so for her, this was absolutely 100% her lesson. She loved this. We also pretended to go shopping. It's my daughter again, who's <laughs> now college age, so you know how time flies. Um, we, we set up a pretend market, and we brought in things that we owned from Ecuador, my students and I. And so those are actual products from Ecuador. And then we put on the screen a picture of an actual market that I had been to and some of my students had been to, too. We taught the kids about money and numbers, and they went around and bought um, objects from the imaginary salespeople, and they had a really good time. Um, here's a guest speaker who's a native speaker from the Dominican Republic, and she came in and talked about um, her country and the weather and the fruit, and she brought fruit for us, and um, she had, um, we, we give the students pictures for their scrapbook that's on the table, and then we also give them an imaginary stamp in their passport. And their passports looked like real passports. They had their name, their country, their birthday, all those things, and we write in the order that you would write the date in Spanish, and everything was all in Spanish. Um, or when we do the weather and the calendar, things like that, we do everything how you would do it in Spanish. It starts with a different day of the week. Capitalization is different. Um, we try to make everything culturally appropriate as well as linguistically. Here's another guest speaker from Peru, and he happened to have worked in tourism. So by the time he left, he had me convinced that I wanted to go to Peru, and he brought a traditional treat for our kids to sample. It's a native speaker from Spain who came in and talked to us, and um, the kids had all kinds of questions about Spain. And this was during um, 
a time when we were talking about, um, I think Ruby Bridges, we were talking about access to school and we had been reading a book about Ruby Bridges and integration of schools. And so we were talking to this student about the experiences in Spain, about what school is like in Spain. We do a lot of fun activities where we have the parents. These are all parents and some of my, my student teachers. Um, we do a lot of interaction. So anyone who's able to speak Spanish is welcome. We're doing kind of a bingo game, like find someone who walking around and then whoever finds the most um, matches wins. And these were things like somebody who has a birthday in March or someone who has lived in another state, things like that. So the kids are using Spanish to interact with people of all different ages, which has been really fun. This is a field trip to the local Mexican grocery store and we did taste testing. That's what the kiddos are doing. They had a little chart and we had gone over words like salty, sweet, sour, spicy, and the kids tasted things and then marked on their, um, on their, on their paper what they had tried, what it tasted like, and then if they liked it or not. And I just worked with the shop owner ahead of time to make sure that we could use all Spanish while we were there. And um, we did in 100% Spanish. I had a lot of college students there to help to make sure. So you see some more pictures from that trip to the grocery store. We usually have about one adult for every child or one for every two, because it does take some supervision to make sure they use all Spanish, but we do. We manage to use close to 100% Spanish in all of our classes. Some more pictures from the grocery store. <laughs> and on the picture on the left um, with the boy and the college student, he was a heritage speaker. His dad's from Colombia, and then that student is also a heritage speaker from California. So that was very interesting. And then my other student and um, children's Spanish program member um, were kind of hearing the customers come in and talk to the um, cashier and noticing how the cashier would slow down for us and not so much with the customers. So that was motivating for my students to see that they're on the path to learning, but they still have a long way to go. Uh, this is us practicing to go to a restaurant. We set up an actual kind of table and the kids had um, pieces of paper that said things like, ask for the specials of the day, um, order something to drink, ask what the waiter recommends, ask if you can, you know, ask where the restroom is, um, ask for extra napkins. So the kids had to figure out how to have a conversation. So my college students pretending to be a waiter and we got an, a copy of their menu from the website and I called to make sure it was accurate and current. And so we practiced and the kids knew exactly what was on the menu. So then we went to the restaurant. Here we are at the restaurant and everybody kind of or, could order something that they knew that they might like because we'd already practiced. And we practiced all those things, you know, may I use the restroom? <laughs> could you bring me some water? without ice, you know, all those things that they, we knew the kids wanted to say. So we focus on authentic communication. We did a pretend movie night. <laughs> this is another heritage speaker, Spanish, whose um, family is from, is from Mexico, but she grew up in the US. And um, she's working with one of my students. We had a pretend movie theater. So the student is um, ordering food at the concession stand is what she's doing. And we watched um, a film in class and we practiced ahead of time for the kind of vocabulary that the kids would need. And we made sure that it was a movie that was made for that age group, but from a different country. Uh, we do a lot of artistic projects in our class. This is something called an alfombra, which means a carpet, um, but it's dyed sawdust and you make a pattern of dyed sawdust in kind of a frame. Um, and we made it in a frame, but usually they're on a street so people can walk by and admire them. Um, but we had a coloring contest. So on the bottom left, you'll see the, um, the flowers that are, that was colored by the little girl. You can see her, she has the blue gloves with the red hair. She was the contest, um, coloring contest winner. <laughs> and then uh, we, we decided to make this project and it took a lot of help. Um, luckily I'm married to a professional artist. So he made that frame and he dyed all that sawdust. He had the sawdust from making things out of wood, but he collected it, dyed it, kept it separated for me and I would bring it in each time. And it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. And the kids remember things like colors and um, shapes and things because we use those words over and over when we make things like this. Um, here's a student who's teaching some kiddos and they're playing bingo. The sound quality is kind of low, so I'm not gonna play this today, but um, if we played it, you'd hear her um, counting with the kids using the markers and counting out how many markers each kid gets. Um, and the kids are following along and they know exactly um, how to play because we do a lot of activities that have routines. So these kids know, they know how to play this bingo game, um, but we play it with all different kinds of content. 
So to keep the kids in Spanish, we use a lot of routines. So it's predictable, but we keep it fun. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the results of this scholarship? We've done presentations and we've made some publications on the community standard for foreign language learning. There are five standards and normally they're pretty easy to do in the classroom, like communication and cultures and comparisons and connections, um, like connecting things to other fields, like we connected to art, we communicate, we speak all the time. We talk about culture, talking about um, having the moms come in and sing the birthday song to their daughter, that would be culture. Um, comparisons, we're always comparing different things, like um, when it's summer here, which season is it in Argentina, for example. So we're always comparing, we're always doing all those other things. But the fifth C, they're all called five Cs, is communities. And communities is harder. It's harder to bring people from the community into your classroom and to take your kids out into the classroom than all the other standards. But we're pretty fortunate. Our program is small. We have a lot of engaged parents and college students who are willing to make that happen. Um, we focus on high leverage teaching practices, which are practices that new teachers can focus on so that their teaching is effective without having to worry about all the other things that, that you could possibly be doing. I've been teaching forever and I'm still learning something new every week. So it helps to start with a base of practices that you know are effective and then work from there. So we focus on high leverage teaching practices and I've published some things about that. Um, I've worked a lot with my students about planning to improvise, meaning if you don't have a plan, it's very hard to go off the plan. So we plan, we make everything somewhat detailed, and then I want to make sure everybody knows exactly what we're planning to do when we go in. But when we go in, we have to improvise based on who's there, what they're finding motivating that day, uh, what's not being understood, what is being understood. So the more prepared we are, the better able we are to improvise. And so I've done a lot of things with my students about kind of um, based on theater um, games. And I think that really helps my students to realize that teaching is an art. It's not something that you plan and then you enact based on how you planned it. Um, you're working with other humans and humans are unpredictable. So learning to improvise on the spot is really important. Um, I've done a lot of research on heritage speaker teachers. I've had quite a few heritage speaker teachers and they bring a lot of strengths. They bring a lot of cultural knowledge, pronunciation, uh, knowledge of different ways to say things. And so that's something I focus on a lot rather than um, seeing a heritage speaker, someone who isn't a native speaker, maybe doesn't know the language as well as they wish. I don't see the, the weaknesses that way. I see those as strengths that we can build on. Um, there's a lot of literature that these days is talking about, um, there's a continuum of, of bilingualism that, you know, if you're only able to speak English, maybe you're here. If, you're, if you can speak only Spanish, maybe you're here. But ideally, you want to be somewhere along that continuum. And no one really is right in the center, which would mean you're a balanced bilingual. It's kind of a myth that any person who speaks two languages or more can do everything equally well in those languages. It's not it's not practical or possible to expect that from anyone. No one goes to church in both languages, takes all their college classes in both languages, reads the exact same books in both languages. That, that would be ridiculous. So um, some people have a wealth of vocabulary in one area of their life because they use that language for that. But then maybe they have more vocabulary in the other language for another area because they use the vocabulary for that. So if you've grown up speaking only Spanish to your grandma, you're vocabulary will be different than if you grew up speaking Spanish to everyone. So kids sometimes will have vocabulary to talk to their friends that's a different, that's all in English maybe, for, they went to school in English, but then they're used to answering their, Spanish, their parents in Spanish around the dinner table. So they bring a lot of strengths and we talk a lot about that. Um, we do a lot of research on trying to use 100% Spanish to teach Spanish, which is as hard as it sounds. I don't know many, um, subject matters that use their content to teach their content. But if you can imagine like an English as a second language class, you have a lot of children from other countries who have another native language, but they're learning English using English. And so that's exactly what we try to do is we know that all, most of our kids have English as a first language, but what if they didn't? What if we had a kid whose first language was Chinese or Russian, what would we do? And so that's how we treat it, is we have to make it comprehensible, we have to repeat ourselves, we have to act things out, we have to use visuals and gestures to make things understandable, and maybe we reduce some of the material so that, we, so that it's manageable, 
for the kids instead of so much translation from English to Spanish, English to Spanish all the time and talking about the language, we spend more time using the language. And our latest project is a collaborative curricular planning process to address the challenges of teaching in a pandemic. So we've had to move our children's Spanish program online and we have an, a synchronous class with kids on Zoom. And then we have some other kids who are doing some work asynchronously just on their own time. But it's been a learning experience and we were already in the midst of replanning our curriculum with the faculty grant that I obtained last year. I have students working with me to plan seven years of a program. And the idea is that children could come into the program at any point during those seven years, but each year we'll have a theme. And we have a lot of kind of unique ideas for what we want to do. And we're commissioning illustrations. We're going to try to commission some videos from families abroad, especially our college students who are studying abroad with host families, if they're willing, and um, audio recordings and things so that our curriculum is, is specific to our kids um, who are taking class with us at E-Town College. So that's our current um, plan. And I wish I would have taken time to go back and make a list of all the students who have worked with me on this program over the last over 10 years. Um, but if I had to guess, I would say it's been at least 40 students who have helped me with this program. So maybe someday I'll, I'll sit down and make the list. Um, and if, they did, if their picture didn't make it in, I apologize. I have lots and lots of pictures. Um, but I would love to hear from some of the alumni who have helped with this program. I'd love to hear what year you helped, what you did, what you thought of it, um, if it had any impact on your future career. I know we have a lot of students who didn't um, major in Spanish education, but they went on to become Spanish teachers. So I would like to hear about that too. So to conclude, we are global citizens empowered to inspire across generations. My Blue Jay students, our community partners, the kids that we teach and myself, we're engaged in a lot of ways, teaching languages in the US and abroad. We have lots of students that are Spanish head majors that picked their jobs. They pointed to the school they wanted to teach in and they said, I want to teach Spanish here and I want to teach this sport. And the school said, absolutely, because our students have so much teaching experience, partly from the Children's Spanish program. Uh, we also have students teaching abroad. We have quite a few Fulbright scholarship winners. In fact, 100% of our Spanish ed majors who have applied have, have earned them, which is unheard of. Um, we've had at least one student volunteer for city year. We are sharing our language and our culture at home and abroad. And we're presenting our work nationally and internationally, getting the Elizabethtown College name and our motto, Educate for Service, out into the world. Real. That was awesome. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> Thank you. That, was, that was absolutely wonderful. I have to tell you, um, the last piece you said about Spanish education students, all of them being Fulbright recipients, I did not know that. <laughs> That's incredible. Cool. All, all the ones who have applied have, have earned one. They haven't applied, okay. but all the ones who have applied have gotten one, which is unheard of. And we've even had two who were repeat Fulbrights. They were, they were awarded a second year, which is, it's, it's almost unheard of to happen even once. And we've had it happen twice. Yep, I hear you, Charlotte. So, That's absolutely incredible. I, again, thank you for doing this. And I have a couple follow-up questions for you, if, if you wouldn't mind answering sure. them. So um, my first one is, um, do you run into challenges? And, and this is kind of a two-part question. So how do you go out into the community and get, and get the kids, first of all? And then do you ever have challenges in, um, in scheduling them, in scheduling the college students, in scheduling the students to come? And I'm, I'm assuming it's like after, an after five o'clock time frame, but if you could just talk a little bit to that piece of it. Sure. Um, what I've done is we decided to pick a time and stick with it. So what we do is, because um, we want it to be predictable, because a lot of the families have dance class and soccer class and everything else. So um, we do Wednesdays from 4.45 to 5.30. Um, it used to be 5 to 5.45, but we've moved it back a tiny bit. Um, but that seems to work pretty well. And we have some families who maybe a babysitter brings the kids or something like that. Um, we have talked about moving it into the schools, like an after-school program. And I've interested in doing that. We started out um, in a school, and it was, it was nice. I liked that. Um, so we could do that. I just felt like it wasn't as an equal opportunity experience if we had it in a specific school. Um, so 
that's why. And also, I feel like I'm recruiting future Blue Jays because the kiddos come to campus and they they'll say like, I'm a Blue Jay. I'm an Etown College student. You know, like they because we've done like um, scavenger hunts and things like that where we're all over like the Dell and the gym and um, and so they start to feel like you know they could go here. They it's they picture themselves here, which is really cool. Sure. So yeah is a recruiting tool too. <laughs> you know, Charlotte, I was going to say, it's like there's benefits abound. I mean, there's benefits in, in this program everywhere. And you know, mm -hmm. what's interesting to me is you, you have the college students and, and I, the, again, another two part question, but you have the college students who are learning how to teach Spanish, but then you have students like students who are both Spanish speaking, like kids that are Spanish speaking mm -hmm. and, and non-Spanish speaking all coming together and learning mm -hmm. in this, in this way is it's just the collaboration um it, so it is pretty it is pretty amazing and that's one thing i was going to mention is that we do have a kind of like a special where i i've only advertised by word of mouth so far but i have a lot of spanish-speaking friends in the area and what we do is if the parents are spanish speakers but the children are not and the parents are willing to give some time and service to the program they can pay half price and if the child is a native speaker we just automatically give the parents 100 percent free tuition because kids are our resources in our program. Like the little guy that I showed you and his sister and they have, the, they were filling yeah. in about the weather. Yeah. He was so cute because he didn't know when he was speaking English or Spanish. Like he, you know, the kids would say, how do you say this in Spanish? And he would just say it in both because he, he didn't really separate them. You know, he's just like, I speak this and I speak that. And he, and he was too little to really, you know, but he was one of the kids that he, he taught us a lot of things we wanted to learn how to say. And, um, so yeah, kiddos like that, they get 100% uh, free tuition. Well, so, yeah. I have to tell you, Charlotte, I'm, I'm in all of, I'm in all of a, for a student mm -hmm. that can do it at college too, but a, a, a kid that can do it too, just be able to speak <laughs> both languages like that is just, I'm in all of that, to be perfectly honest. Well, and that's part, that's part of my kind of um, underlying, I guess, kind of hidden agenda sort of, is that I mentioned before the heritage speakers, they bring a lot of strengths to the class. So not the teachers who are heritage speakers, but also the kiddos who participate in the program. I'm trying to boost their self-esteem. Um, that picture I showed of the little boy and his sister, she actually, I'm going to check back in with her and see if she's become a Spanish teacher. She would be a senior in high school now. Oh, wow. Okay. See, with, see I'm going to ask her mom if she has become a Spanish teacher, because honestly, she was all about, like, she wanted to call on people. She wanted to write stuff on the board, and she was so helpful. She was basically almost at the same level as my college students in terms of like, all oh, right, you know, we're playing hangman. She's like, all right, I'm and she could. And she was very young. So she loved it. And I think it really did boost her self esteem that she was helping teach other kids her one of her two languages, you know, that they, they were struggling just to kind of begin with one and she already had two. So that's part of my kind of hidden agenda too. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Now, Charlotte, can I ask you, have you always, um, have you always been understanding or found knew the importance of service learning or did you have like a certain aha moment where you were like service learning is how we're gonna well, first of all how i'm going to teach my college students but how i'm also going to teach spanish education in general i guess that's a good question because um i did come to elizabethtown partly because of the motto educate for service i had a lot of interviews all across the country i really didn't have a specific place I wanted to be. I wanted to work at a small liberal arts school because I went to progressively larger public schools and my education kind of got worse with each like jump up in size. And so I decided small liberal arts college is where I want to be, but I didn't, I didn't narrow it by geography at all. So I could have been in like California, South Dakota, um, Texas, where I lived. Um, so it was kind of a, like throw, throw at the dartboard kind of thing. But um, the educate for service motto caught my attention. And then when I came to visit, I loved Etown. town. I thought everybody's so nice. It took me about a year to realize people weren't just being extra nice to me because I was new. They were just that nice. Like I really truly was like, guys, I'm not that new anymore. You don't have to like right. hold the door and like wave at me, you know? Sure, and I, sure. I came from a huge school. UT Austin is huge. And um, I just, I thought they were just being nice to me because I was new, but nope, they're, I'm, you know, 14 years later and everyone's still just as nice. Um, but to answer your question, um, my first experience with service learning was when I was in high school learning Spanish and the local elementary school needed a tutor for a little girl who was recently arrived from Mexico. I think she was about second or third grade and she knew math like no other. She was so good at math, but she didn't understand the word problems. And she would get so frustrated because she didn't know. She, she would say, why don't they just say plus or minus? Yeah. <laughs> 
I have to say, like, you have seven trees in your orchard and each tree has 14 apples and two fell off this one. You know, she's like, it's too much. Like, I don't understand all the, the words. Yep. She's like, right, seven minus two, you know, I've got it. And it's true. So I helped her understand the words and then she did all the math. Like, sometimes it would take me longer to check her math. <laughs> you know, she might have been a little bit older, but still, it wasn't very advanced math. And so she would answer the math before I even kind of got the words out, you know. It would have been tempting to just write it for her, like two plus five equals, but I didn't. I, I worked through, like, this is what an orchard is, and this is what an apple tree is, and um, it was good, I, but I realized I was learning from her, because she would use a word that I didn't know, and so then I'd ask her, what, what does that mean? So I started bringing a notebook, like, the words I'm learning from this elementary school child, um, but I'm helping her with her math, and so I don't think it, I knew it was called service learning, but that's when I first became interested in in really using Spanish. But I wasn't planning to be a Spanish teacher. I was a psychology major, Spanish minor. I was going to go to graduate school in industrial organizational psychology. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to study how um, humans interact with machines. That's what I wanted to study. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's what I did all my undergraduate research, like 11 credits, like a tenth of my undergraduate credits were that, like wow. industrial organizational psychology. I have no idea how it ended up in Spanish, um, but I, I kind of do because I went abroad with a Rotary Scholarship and fell in love with Spain and fell in love with Spanish language. And I realized that my interest in psychology was really more about learning, like how do humans learn machines and how do designers learn to make machines that are intuitive to humans? Because you can make a great machine, but if a human doesn't know how to use it, it's useless. So you almost have to dumb down the machine so that humans can use them. <laughs> so that's what fascinated me. It was more like, okay, yeah, like we want to learn things, but how do we learn things? What's the best way to learn like information and how do you get it to stick in your brain and how do you not lose it? So that's what I realized is I was really interested in how do we learn languages, but also how do we keep them? Because I always say it's opposite of like strength training, like strength training, you know, it, it's pretty easy. It's pretty hard to build up your muscle and it's really easy to lose it, you know, and the same thing with languages. It's really hard. It's not the opposite. It's the same. Um, it's really hard to build up your language proficiency and it's really easy to lose it. Yeah. It's exactly like physical fitness, anything like that. It's like so hard to money. It's hard to earn and it's easy to spend. And that's exactly how language is hard. Yeah. You're, you're, you're I'm really interested in that. Yeah. How do you motivate yourself to keep learning and how do you retain it? And, yeah. Well, that's what's so interesting to me, Charlotte, about what you just said. So you went from um, being interested in learning how humans learn how to work machinery to how humans learn language. <laughs> I mean, it, <laughs> the correlation is it, 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 at the root of it, it's all about how humans learn. And I think that's mm -hmm. what that's what's so interesting, and, and I think that's why you've, been, you, you've built this incredible program out of, out of that service learning mentality. So, and I just think that's awesome. So, so Charlotte, let me ask, I got one more question for you. Um, so my last question is, and I don't know if you get, you might get this a lot, so I apologize, but um, do you see correlations between kids being able to learn Spanish and how they retain it and how adults, like have you done, I guess my question is, have you done a lot related to adults and how they learn and retain Spanish? Well, yes, because my college students are adults. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, really, truly, before about the age of 12, they say that's about kind of the cutoff um, in terms of learning really good pronunciation. Young kids hear it better. But um, honestly, I think it's around 10 months of age when babies start, their brains start to kind of prune out things they don't need. So if they've never heard the sound, they might, they might, their brain kind of disregards it. So the younger kids are ex uh, exposed to pronunciation, the better. But that doesn't mean that an adult can't learn. It's just they might not achieve native speaker pronunciation, which, you know, is, is unreasonable, probably. Um, and also, I think kids sometimes don't know how to talk about language. So like the little guy I told you about, the kids would say, well, how do you say that in Spanish? And he'd be like, isn't that what I just did? <laughs> and they're like, no, you said it in English. And he's like, I did. Like, he just didn't, he was just like, that's, you know, that's this and that's that, and I don't know. Uh, so we'd say, do you know another way to say it? And then he would say it in the other language. So, you know, we couldn't say things like translate the word. You know, he's like, what is it? I don't know what that means. Whereas adults like to talk about language a little bit more. I got you. Yep. Yeah. So what I've realized with my college students is a lot of them like to talk about the language, and I do too. Like, I'm, I'm nerdy about that stuff. I really like it. But I don't think the classroom's the right place for it. I really don't, unless it's a grammar class. It's called grammar something. Um, because I think that that's something that students can kind of do on their own and then come into the class and then we practice. So I use what's called a flipped classroom and maybe my students don't love it. I don't know, but I have them do a lot of things outside of the class. Okay. 
with the, my theory is that if I don't like to do anything in class that they could do on their own. So I'm never going to sit there with you and do flashcards with you in class. If you want to sit outside on a beautiful sunny day and do that, I will do that with you all day. But I don't want to do it in class, right? Because you could easily do that on your own. Or like filling in the blanks, I'll give them like um, gapped notes. And so they have to listen to grammar tutorials and listen and kind of fill in some notes and things. And it's things like the indicative mood is used for this and the subjunctive mood is used for that. And so they, they work with that material in English at a college level before they come in. And <laughs> they come in and we use Spanish at like elementary, middle school level because that's, that's where they are, you know. Some of them are more advanced, um, but in the lower levels, that's what we do. And so that's the way I that's the way I found to balance it is my students intellectually are ready to talk about language at a high level. But that's not really what I want to use my class time for. I want to use my class time for actual engagement and communication. So I need them to be there to talk to each other and I put them in pairs and groups and it's spontaneous. It's not usually planned. We do some planned things, but Usually it's pretty spontaneous and I need them to do that background work first so that I know they're going to come in and know, like, know what we're going to practice today. And then when we practice, that's when questions come up. They're like, oh, I know how to conjugate it, but I don't know how to use it. So then we're like, okay, well, this is how you use it. Um, so that's kind of how I, I see the difference. Um, and also I think adults tend to see a language as a big system and they find it intimidating, like Spanish, <laughs> German. Russian and kids are just like they see it as like a word, you know, like you teach them one word and they think they know that language. Like I've heard little kids say I know Spanish and they're like people are like, oh, you know, and they start speaking to sure. them. Sure. Like, they're like I know like hola and adios and that's all I know. But the kids are like, yeah, I know Spanish, meaning some Spanish. They know at least one word of Spanish. Sure. Adults tend to be the opposite way. Like my college students, they're like, oh, no, I don't know Spanish. I'm like, you know, a lot more Spanish than a lot of people I know, you know a lot more Spanish than you knew at the beginning of the semester. So bring continuum again is like here's somebody who only speaks English here's somebody who only speaks Spanish and yeah most of us are somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. you don't want to just be on one of these ends and be okay about that I think it doesn't have to be Spanish and English it could be any language but ideally everybody's trying to get a little more toward the the middle um where you can do a lot of things in both languages so that's one thing I'd say is kid, little kids tend to be overconfident <laughs> and then um college students adults tend to be um kind of like underconfident yeah sure sure <laughs> you brought that up because I appreciated the one the one piece you said about how you can plan and plan and plan and the human element is so unpredictable so mm -hmm. I, I jotted that down and that you were you're <laughs> so right especially for teachers um and so true <laughs> I do think that's partly what I got out of my my undergraduate education in psychology is that we did a lot of studies where like there'd be a photocopier and we have a camera and we would, we would record their hands and we would tell them, you know, make a single copy of this document. Everybody was like, Shh, no problem. But they'd run it through the little thing, no problem. But then they got progressively harder. <laughs> and so what we were looking at is where did their hands go on the machine? How long did it take them to do it? Where did they expect the buttons to be? There was a little manual with like codes in it. Did they actually look at the manual? Did they do the codes? Um, or did they give up? And so that's what we pretty much told people is like, anytime you want, you can say I'm done with this activity. And so it was interesting to see how many people could, it was like single-sided copy, double-sided copy, staple something, you know, and make a little book, make a book that folds in four, you know? And so it was really interesting to see, like, and we couldn't say anything. We could just, we would just say, figure it out. And it was interesting to see how people persisted, how many people gave up. Um, the impact of their prior knowledge, their prior experience. Sure. Um, one thing I learned is that you can, the best laid plans will go awry if you don't pay attention to what is happening in the class. Mm -hmm. It's hard because you can't, you don't want to leave anybody behind, but then you also have a lot of students who are really excelling. So that's one of the hardest things about being a teacher is that what I mentioned before, differentiated instruction is, you know, some people might, this is, this is what I planned, but maybe I need to give you a little more time to do it. And then somebody else is like, man, I did all the stuff that you had planned. Is there something else I could do? Sure, sure. Other ones, I'm like, you want to come to Children's Benefit for <laughs> and help us out or, you know. Sure. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's one of the hardest things about being a teacher is, um, you know, there's no like, mythical student that you just show up and they love your subject as much as you do they're got a good night's sleep they know everything up until now they're ready to go like that's kind of a mythical perfect student so you can plan for that student all you want but then when you get there you have to um work with <laughs> with what is 
Yeah, but without lowering your expectations, that's the hard part is I, I tend to have very high expectations. And I expect that from my college students too. Um, I tell them, you know, you it's easy to go from being kind of strict to being a little more fun, but it's very hard to go from being the student's best friend who's like, we can do whatever you guys want. We don't have to learn any Spanish here. You can't flip that around to all of a sudden be like, oh guys, we have a, we have a test coming up. We better start studying. It's too, it's almost too late. Right. So I'm having high expectations. And when I see my students reaching those or at least trying to reach them, that's when I tend to be like, hey, maybe for some extra credit, why don't you guys do this or that? Or I'll have a couple of assignments where they're not based on like accuracy or anything. They're just based on can you communicate? So write a blog post about something like, did you go to a um, Mexican restaurant? Did you watch a Spanish film? Did you talk to your cousin in Colombia? You know, and write a little blog post about it. And I don't sometimes on these assignments, I don't grade it. Like I don't, I don't, I don't grade it for accuracy. You know, if you got your point across to me, then you get all the points for the assignment. And I, I like to do some things like that too, kind of lower the stress level yep. um, because it is, it's, it's stressful to learn something when the teacher is like, that's right. That's wrong. That's right. That's wrong. And they are like verb conjugations are right or they're wrong. Yep. Um, of course. Although they can change by um, over time. Like sometimes things do change. Um, some rules do change, but in general, you can say that's how you kind of, this is how everyone conjugates this verb, but that doesn't mean that you can't communicate. Mm -hmm. So little kids will say like, um, mommy, I run fast. And no, no parent ever says it's, I ran fast. <laughs> you know, like every parent, right, right. Like, good, job. good job. You did run fast. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we, we respond to the message and then we correct them like kind of in a natural way sure. or we just hope that they'll pick it up someday. We don't stop and be like, say it again. You know, like that would just ruin the kid's enthusiasm for what they just said. Right. So, so yeah, that's kind of a fine line too, is you want everyone to be able to communicate, but you also want them to do it correctly. So um, I saw a graphic once of um, teachers in general, not just language teachers, but it showed an iceberg and it showed like above the water line, the tip of the iceberg. That's what people see when they see like a classroom. And then 90% that's below water is everything else, the planning, the reflection, the um, adapting your materials, differentiated instruction, the sleepless nights over the kid that is not learning, bullying, like all that stuff, 90% um, that nobody sees. Sure. Yep. Well, well, Charlotte, thank you so much. This was, this was just been awesome. And, and I wanted to say too, if anybody wants to reach out to you about um, any of your programming, um, are they, they're able to do that? Is that sure, okay? Yeah. So, um, where and I, your your email? Um, you can contact Charlotte. Or her email is lorenzinc at etown.edu. If you have any um follow up questions or anything else you want to ask her, she is she is open and and etown is very lucky to have her. So um, <laughs> thank you so much again. And um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much.